I will call this meeting of the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners working session to order. Edwin, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Brabeck? Here. Commissioner Dietrich? Here. Commissioner Jamnick? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Labar? Here. Commissioner martinez Kratz. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Ping? Commissioner Smith? Here. Great, thank you. Um, first up, we have the opportunity for citizen participation. Are there any citizens who'd like to address us tonight? Okay, seeing none, we will skip Commissioner follow-up. Uh, County Administrator's report. No report. Great. Uh, for, then we'll jump right into our discussion items. First, we have the Broadband Committee uh, Subcommittee update and Barb Fuller here. Thank you for being here. Good to see you. Oh, Commissioner Fuller, sorry. Yes, Commissioner Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, I feel like a Chippendale commercial here. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Barbara Fuller, and as chair of the Broadband Equity Subcommittee, I wish to thank you for this opportunity to provide a status report on our progress. With me tonight is Ben Feynman. Ben is vice chair of the subcommittee, and he has considerable expertise with the technical aspects of broadband, and at the pleasure of the chair, uh, we'll welcome your questions. The purpose of the Broadband Subcommittee is to explore immediate and long-term countywide broadband access and equity. Another way to think about this is digital inclusion. That is the goal, including everyone, ensuring that affordable, high-speed broadband access reaches everyone. Your meeting materials that you received ahead of time contain the written progress report that indicates a work plan schedule of the subcommittee's activities beginning last September and extending through the end of this calendar year. As you may recall, this subcommittee is scheduled to sunset uh, in December of this year. Allow me to offer some background on the two of us and on the genesis of the subcommittee. Both Ben and I live in townships without high-speed broadband access. I live in Sharon Township, and Ben lives in Linden Township. Both of us are board members of the Michigan Broadband Cooperative. Ben is the president, and I am a vice president of that group whose mission is to build community-controlled broadband infrastructure for unserved and underserved areas of Michigan. Our involvement with this subcommittee is an extension of our vision of ubiquitous broadband coverage in Washtenaw County and ultimately across the state of Michigan. With your approval last July, the Broadband Equity Subcommittee was created to explore immediate and long-term county-wide high-speed broadband internet access and equity. Again, the concept of digital inclusion applies. This 11-member subcommittee has been meeting monthly since last fall. Commissioners Michelle Dietrich, Kent Martinez-Kratz, Alicia Ping, and Conan Smith are subcommittee members, and I want to thank them for their participation. We have heard from a dozen panelists thus far representing the telecommunications industry, state government, entrepreneurs, home-based businesses, and talent attraction consultants. At future sessions, as the work plan that you all have indicates, we will listen to and learn from educators, local elected officials, a lawyer with expertise in telecom law, policymakers, and those responsible for managing e-government services. We will submit our final report and recommendations to you this November. For tonight's conversation, I have provided, and they've been distributed to your places, a few additional documents to help with key points. Uh, let me first start with what is high-speed broadband. The FCC defines high-speed broadband as connection speeds of at least 25 megabits downstream and 3 megabits upstream. Cable connections from Comcast and Charter, as well as some high-end DSL lines from AT&T and Frontier, are examples of broadband services. Ben can speak more specifically about the technical aspects and differences later tonight. So who has broadband access? You will see in your materials that the there is a lack of broadband access by nearly half of Washtenaw County, and that was actually the impetus behind the formation of this subcommittee. The two maps that you have before you of Washtenaw County illustrate where there is broadband access and where there is not. Keep in mind that these maps actually over-report broadband access because of how the data was compiled. It was compiled that if one household in a census block 
had broadband access, then the entire block was considered covered. There are actually fewer households with coverage than the map would suggest. So why does it matter? How has it become a necessity, just like electricity? A few examples of how high-speed internet access is integral to modern life are the following. Kindergartners are being assigned iPads in school. Third graders have their homework posted in Google Docs. Middle school and high school students are assigned laptops, and typically sixth to eighth grade is when they are allowed to start taking them home. Otherwise, they're supposed to stay at school. The expectation, of course, is for those who can take the devices home, that they're supposed to use them at home, accessing things online, videos, doing research, collaborative projects with other classmates. <laughs> sometimes here, sometimes in other parts of the country, sometimes around the world. Without broadband, home values are depressed and homes are increasingly unmarketable. People expect the toilet to flush and the lights to come on when they shop for a new house. Likewise, they expect broadband to be available. When it is not, they move on, often declining to even look at a house if it doesn't have broadband. People with medical conditions that require frequent monitoring rely on a stable broadband connection to interact with their doctors remotely. Economic development and talent attraction is stifled in areas without broadband. Home-based home businesses and those working from home are hampered by unreliable, slow internet access and cost-prohibitive data caps. These are just a few examples of why digital inclusion is essential today and how the digital divide creates inequity in our county and puts residents in rural areas at a measurable disadvantage as compared to those living in urbanized settings. As you can see, the western half of Washtenaw County is being left behind and cut out of the opportunities that broadband access provides. Despite persistent appeals to providers, they have no plans for broadband expansion in the rural areas of our county. The underlying cause for this lack of expanded access is the profit motive of the, of the incumbent providers. If an area cannot demonstrate an acceptable short-term return on their investment, the build-out will not happen. Recognizing the importance of high-speed broadband access and acknowledging the disadvantages and inequities created by the lack of high-speed broadband internet access, Linden Township, where Ben lives, their residents voted last August by a two-to-one margin to tax themselves to build their own broadband infrastructure. Sharon Township, where I live, will vote on May 8th on a similar millage, and Manchester Township, has recently approved funding for a feasibility study to do the very same thing in that township. It is worth noting that broadband access is a nonpartisan issue. Both Governor Snyder and gubernatorial candidate Gretchen Whitmer have made digital inclusion a top priority. In your packet, you have the cover to the report of Governor Snyder's 21st Century Infrastructure Commission. That report was issued in November of 16. That report noted that 450,000 Michigan households lack access to broadband. Governor Snyder's current Michigan Consortium of Advanced Networks seeks to do the following. Identify gaps in broadband service coverage and capacity. Identify current efforts underway to address connectivity issues. And to identify key strategies and recommendations for the state and private sector to pursue to achieve enhanced connectivity. Ben serves on the Catalyst Grant subgroup of that consortium that will make recommendations on the disbursement of $20 million in grant funds during fiscal year 2018, ostensibly to help close those gaps. The consortium itself will issue its report and recommendations in August of this year. Your last um, item in the materials that was, were at your places tonight uh, indicate that just this past Tuesday, Gubernatorial candidate Gretchen Whitmer included broadband expansion of one of the key elements of her infrastructure plan for Michigan. She's pledging to pursue access to high-speed broadband internet for every Michigan resident by 2022. Furthermore, Whitmer would implement net neutrality by executive order, establish a state broadband office, 
and pursue an aggressive rural broadband strategy to bridge the urban rural digital divide. In conclusion, affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband is the foundation of the new economy. All Washtenaw County residents deserve equal access to the essential infrastructure. We all deserve to be included. I commend and thank you for your vision and leadership in establishing this subcommittee to explore immediate and long-term countywide broadband access and equity to achieve true digital inclusion for all of our residents. I look forward to offering additional insights and recommendations to you in the subcommittee's final report this coming November. At the chair's pleasure, uh, Ben and I will respond to questions. I want to thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you so much, Commissioner Fuller. Um, I also just want to acknowledge um, Andy Brush from our county staff and Kyle Mazurik, who are also on the committee. Um, thanks for being here as well. Um, and I will shoot to Commissioner Smith for a question. Oh, Commissioner Brabeck. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much, Commissioner Fuller. Uh, one of the questions that I had in um, being behind the idea that, that we be inclusive, particularly mm -hmm. knowing um, about business owners who can't run their businesses because the, because the data costs so much for them to do that and becoming cost prohibitive, um, and that just not being okay to, to have that economic opportunity for everyone throughout um, our county, besides the education uh, things that, that, are, right. that are happening. Um, the decisions that companies make in terms of where they put broadband, is that based solely on population? It's our understanding that uh, the incumbent carriers, if I'm hearing your question correctly, they will place broadband connectivity where they believe they can get a return on their investment in two years or less. In terms of connections into business parks and to large industrial users, do you have insights on that? Because I know in Dexter, their industrial park um, was provided with so they had it. fiber. But, but the person in their home. Not the entire city. Right. The person in their home who's trying to, to run a business might not have that That, that is access. correct. And the supervisor in Sharon Township actually has fiber running past his house. But can't get access to and it? And has been denied access to it. So... Um, there are situations like that that have pushed townships like ours, like Ben's, right. to say, okay, We'll then. do it ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And pay for it ourselves, to put the infrastructure in. Right. There would then be a provider that would run traffic over the fiber that the township owns, but the township would not be the, pri the, prov the provider. Got it, okay. So, if they want to return on their investment within two years, that basically means people paying bills that would cover the, however much the infrastructure cost. Is that, that, is that accurate? That's my understanding. Okay. So do they, they don't do it by countywide. They do it, it sounds like, down to the block. Uh, they'll do it by subdivisions. They'll do it um, in areas where there's density of housing, <coughs> whether that's block by block. I mean, I can't speak to that but if there is inadequate density from their point right. of view they won't in the investment they won't go that. there you want to add anything i was going to ask comes if kyle wanted to add anything <laughs> <laughs> oh dear no. i don't know what that means <laughs> come on up all right kyle deals with these business Hour to hour, right? No, Commissioner Brayback, just to answer your question, I think you would find, I can only speak to cable wireline sure. infrastructure, and that's going to follow density. Okay. So, um, you know, there's FCC data out there that suggests that in terms of the urban portion of Washtenaw County, 95% of it has access to speeds 25 megs or higher. So, again, that cable wireline infrastructure is going to follow that follow the density. Um, the struggle becomes, if you look at Western uh, Washtenaw, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll find Comcast is uh, well built out in city of Chelsea, well built out in the village of Manchester, well built out in city of Dexter. But as you get out into some of the surrounding townships where it gets more sparsely, sparsely populated, uh, you're less likely to find that wireline infrastructure, so. That's helpful. Are there any exceptions or arguments that can be made in terms of you know, the digital inclusion or, or that would be compelling? 
to providers to actually follow through on this? I, I, I know you I, can't answer for yeah, providers. Yeah, no, I wish, I wish uh, you know, being sitting on this committee that I had a readily available solution sure. for, the, for the less densely populated areas of the county, but at this time I don't. There are other technologies that are being developed. Uh, you know, fixed wireless seems to be uh, a solution that you tend to see in, in less densely populated areas, okay. but you know, at this point in time, that's not a solution Comcast offers. Okay. I know Charter, um, I've seen st things in, in recent trade publications that they're uh, you know, seemingly toying around with that, toying, I should say, experimenting with that. Um, so I, I think there are things that are on the horizon, but I don't know that they're fully baked yet and able to be deployed in the more rural areas. So there may be options forthcoming, but right now, this broad, like, the way that we know it in broadband as we know it is the way to be able to get it to folks. We just don't have an opportunity because of the population is the barrier. Yeah, for, for a cable wireline sort of service, it's gonna follow it's gonna follow density. So if I'm, you know, in a in a Dexter or Chelsea and I've and we've got a you know subdivision ad adjacent to to you know where our existing infrastructure is, you know, odds are we're going to work with that developer to make sure that that subdivision is going to be well served. But again, it gets back to the the density issue where there's got to be sufficient density to justify extending the cable wireline infrastructure, and that just that has to do for, with the infrastructure costs. It's very, uh, it's it's very capital intensive. Um, I know folks get frustrated that they don't have more. Um, cable options in, in, in certain communities. They don't feel there's enough com competition. Part of the reason for, for that is because of the nature of the infrastructure mm -hmm. and what it costs. I mean, there's nothing excluding another cable provider from coming into, say, a city of Ann Arbor and, and competing with Comcast or competing with AT&T. It's just someone with that amount of capital is deciding that it just doesn't make sense from a return on investment uh, you know, perspective to, to build out. So. Thank you, that's really helpful. Thank you, I appreciate it. I guess the only thing I'll add, um, I agree with everything Kyle said, uh, and um, to add to what Barb said, you know, the, uh, the, the incumbent telecom providers um, are, are looking to make a profit, and that's not a bad thing, that's why they're in business, um, and so the challenge for them is making their money back quickly enough. That's one of the reasons that Linden Township has pursued municipal financing because that project, which is a very expensive project, is being financed over a 20-year period. Um, as we discussed, Linden Township does not want to be an internet service provider, um, mm -hmm. but being able to finance the infrastructure and then bring in a private service provider to operate it um, is a way to alleviate the, the burden of that initial capital investment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a, a couple of questions, and then I'll go to Commissioner Dietrich. Um, thank you again for serving on this committee. I think it's a really important issue, and as you've sort of alluded to, um, there isn't a clear, simple solution. Um, but I'm really excited to see where uh, where your findings go at the end of the year here, and to see what recommendations you all come up with. Um, along the lines of Commissioner Brebeck's questions, so. A question I have is what are sort of the, the best alternative options for folks in Western Washtenaw that don't have that broadband access? Is it, I mean, it's not like, it's not dial up, is it? That's what I had as a kid, but. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, assume I it's better than that. dial up still exists, does it? <laughs> um, ben says yes, there are still some people who have that wonderful little sound of their modem dialing into wherever. Um, but you've got fixed wireless. Um, I, my service is Verizon Wireless. What is fixed wireless? Uh, I feel like I should know this as a, a younger person, but I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so fixed wireless just means it's, the signal is delivered wirelessly to a, a piece of equipment that is stationary in your house, and that's to distinguish it from um, mobile wireless, like you know, cell phones are mobile wireless. And so that uh, fixed wireless is a solution for, for some folks. We, we certainly don't have ubiquitous, ubiquitous fixed wireless coverage. And to give you an idea, the, the, the fastest speed that you can get in uh, Western Washtenaw County on fixed wireless is eight megabits at a cost of $200 a month. And so as we discussed earlier, that's well below the threshold that the FCC considers broadband speeds at 25 megabits. Um, a more common solution is satellite. Satellite is pretty much ubiquitously available. 
as long as you can get a view of the southern sky. The, uh, in, in some satellite speeds can be exceeding that 25 megabit uh, speed threshold. The challenge with satellite is that the, um, the latency of the connection is high so that doing real-time applications is either difficult or impossible. And by that, I mean um, you know, having a conversation with somebody uh, over a video chat or um, using a voice over IP or even people connecting into their uh, work systems to work from home using a VPN and things like that. Um, the other challenge with satellite is uh, data caps. And um, most satellite connections have some kind of data cap. Some have different tricks, like you can have free data at 3 a.m. And so we get stories from our residents that make their kids get up in the middle of the night to upload their homework assignments because that's when the data is free. Now the third option, which is common, is cellular. And uh, a lot of people have, um, it's similar to, to tethering to your smartphone, but they have systems that are, are designed to run your house off a cellular connection. The, the main issue with those, again, is the data caps. And um, people hear a lot about unlimited cellular connections. The challenge is that unlimited always has an asterisk after it. And even the unlimited plans have either a, a soft or a hard data cap, which means after a certain amount of data, uh, you'll, you'll either have to pay more or they will slow you down. And so the cellular connections are either a uh, inferior or expensive or, or both solution. I might add that a satellite connection out, for example, where I live, if you have a thunderstorm, if you have a snowstorm, if you have lots of leaves on your trees and the wind's blowing them around, your signal drops out, cuts in and out, it'll drop what you're trying to download or do. And in terms of latency, that, that's a word I've learned on this committee. It's the turnaround time and the signal. So when the mouth is going and there's no words with it, it's because it's got to come back to sync up with what's going on. Okay. The, um, another question I have is, uh, have you, in some of the research you've done so far, seen any solutions that have worked elsewhere? I went to undergrad in, North, in the Upper Peninsula, and one of the things they were experimenting with on campus there was WiMAX technology that I understand isn't really very good technology these days, but it was like countywide, um, this almost like countywide Wi-Fi. Um, and from talking to folks to that know UP? a lot more about this than I do, I'm told that's not a real feasible technology anymore. It was just sort of more of an experiment. But I'm curious if there are other things that you've seen in your research that might be feasible options for us. That's a great question. And it's great to hear that you're familiar with the Northern Michigan project. Um, I've spoken with their CIO on more than one occasion. Um, and it, it is actually a good solution even today. Um, the challenge with them is the technology they're using is um, in the, the LTE frequency uh, spectrum. And so in the Upper Peninsula, they have a lot more available spectrum than we do down here. Um, so we just, we can't do the same thing that, that they're doing at, at NMU. Um, but in terms of other solutions that have worked elsewhere, um, as Kyle mentioned, people are experimenting with fixed wireless. The, uh, the challenge with fixed wireless is, you know, I mentioned we're seeing eight megabits today. If you invest money in it, you can probably get 25, maybe 50 megabits on a really good fixed wireless connection. That's in order of magnitude slower than people are getting in the cities. And Comcast is rolled out or is rolling out gigabit over their, uh, their cable connections, even two gigabit, I think. Um, and so the people in the rural areas, if they're just starting to get 25 megabits, and that's the best the technology is going to be able to do for the foreseeable future, that leaves the rural areas in this inequity situation. Um, I think the most successful model we've seen in other areas is the, uh, the public-private partnerships. And so finding a way for uh, municipalities and the citizens themselves to work with private industry uh, to find innovative solutions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dietrich, I think you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I would like to compliment Commissioner Fuller on uh, an incredibly well-run committee. It's a, a tightly run ship, and every meeting has lots of good content, 
I'm learning so much and I, um, if we can make progress given the state of the law and the economic realities, we will. Um, I wanted to make something as maybe more of a comment than a question, but if you want to expand upon it, it would be great, which is, you know, from the map, it does look like it's pretty much Western Washtenaw that's affected, but as you noted, the data, this really underrepresents the problem. And so I was surprised to go when I attended an Ann Arbor Charter Township meeting, because I represent that township, to hear that they have significant issues and are trying to address them. So that's very close to downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, Webster Township, which, you know, I don't know if you call it Western or Northern uh, part of the county, but they have significant issues as well. So, um, and, and you're just looking even at this map scattered around, there's, there's places all over. Um, so I don't know if you want to expand on that or. You'll be surprised at the dead zones in Washtenaw County. You may have read in the Ann Arbor Observer about Nikki Sundstrom, who I believe is head of social media at U of M and has a home in Sio Township. She has four children, I believe, and said she has 13 devices in her home and they're in a dead zone. She doesn't have connectivity. Um, and she said, if I had known, we never would have bought this house. And she can't get the service there either. So you will be surprised at where all these little pockets arise. And when you realize that this under counts um, the houses that have service, it's worse than this, I guess is the simplest way for me to put it. Um, and we've had great difficulty in trying to go more granular on this data because the incumbent carriers consider that proprietary information. So what you literally would have to do is drive along and try and follow the lines to see who is served and who is not because that they refuse to disclose that information. Um, and Connect Michigan has done Connected Nation, Connected, Connect Mission has done the best that they can do with the data that's available to them. So just keep in mind where you go, oh my goodness, really? It's, it's worse than this. Well, I think we've got a new assignment for the committee members to do drives. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get in cars and go commissioners, along. Martinez, and, yeah. Kratz, and Smith for yeah. that. But um, So uh, can I ask you this issue about uh, the data that would make it so much easier to understand what we need to do. Is that a matter, it's proprietary, could that be addressed under federal or state law or is, do we know? I mean, are there other states where that data is more readily available, for example? I don't know the answer to that question specifically, but I would expect that we would have been told, oh gee, too bad you live in Michigan, they won't talk to you about that data there. Too bad you're not in Ohio or Indiana or Montana or Rhode Island. I've never heard of any other uh, jurisdiction or state where that data becomes available because most of these companies, of course, are national companies, right? So if they're not right. disclosing here, they're not disclosing there either. And I think it was Dexter Township, was it, night that actually went through somehow in their uh, materials in the township hall to try and pinpoint where there was coverage and where there was not. Very labor intensive. And my contention has always been those people get bills every month. That data is available by address, and it's just not made available to anyone. Ann Arbor Charter Township was thinking about trying to do a survey to figure this out, but we know what kind of response you get to mail surveys. So, well, thank you very much, Welcome. and thank you for being here. Thanks for your participation. Um, actually, Barb, I have a question. A, a thought, or sorry, Commissioner Fuller. Um, a, has anyone tried to get the providers to maybe just tweak what they're willing to do? I guess I would understand if they don't want to give you an exact list of every house that doesn't have broadband service, but if they could give you, change that instead of if one house in the census tract has service, has broadband, broadband access, uh, then they say the whole census tract has it. Um, if they could say five or 10 houses in each census tract to sort of raise that number or raise that threshold, just as a consideration, maybe that's something they would be willing to share. Um, I, I believe I understand your question. My question back to you would be, even if they say, so, Commissioner, there are 10 houses in this census block that have it, and there are 200 houses in that census block, how do you know which ones have it and which ones don't? I mean, so it's more information, but what you can do with that information 
to actually map where there's coverage and where there is not, I think would be a real challenge. Oh, I see. Or, or yeah, if anything, if they could just give us a better percentage or something like that. They could. They won't. Right. Okay. Commissioner Jemnick. Thank you. Um, to my friend Barb, <coughs> her um, passion and her um, determination hasn't lowered at all. You're still up here where, you, where I've always known you to be, and, and I want to say to you and the gentleman with you and the others that are working with you, I think it's wonderful. The day you and I had a conversation when you told me that you didn't have it, I was shocked because we all have it. And I just assumed that everybody had it. So I congratulate you for the work that you're doing, all of you in your committee. And if there's ever anything I can do, let me know. Thank you. And just an attaboy to Andy Brush. I mean, he's been a great resource in terms of uh, what county government is doing and rolling out and looking to do in the future and at one of our future sessions as you'll notice on the schedule on the work plan uh, that will be an important concept to talk about so is everything going to be online I'm hearing more and more you can't file things with the court on paper anymore it has to be online uh, permitting is now going to electronic only um, so it's it's the wave of the future, and the future isn't too darn far off. Are there any other questions or comments? With that, thank you all. Thank you thank so you, much man. for Thanks. all your work. Thank you very much. Great. So we will, if I find the agenda here, move on to the Washtenaw County Food Policy Council. Um, thank you so much. Marco Miller. Good evening. I'm Markel Miller. I am the chair of the Washtenaw County Food Policy Council, and I really appreciate being invited to come tonight. I'm also director of community food programs at Food Gatherers. So that's my day job. Um, so I'm going to do a brief overview of the history. It's been a couple years since we've been in front of, of the board, and so just wanted to bring you up to speed where we're at, and then I'll have time for questions, if so permitted. Um, so briefly, I do believe there's a couple things that you were all passed out. So we had made last summer this nice little brochure. Um, and so that has a little bit of the history and the mission of the council. So our mission is to increase and preserve access to safe, local, and healthy food for Washtenaw County residents. And we're a committee, um, or a council rather, that's been um, recognized by the board. That happened back in 2012. And we have several working groups we call policy action teams. And those are the work groups that meet monthly or um, every other month and really dive into policy issues that relate to the food system. So we break those up by kind of issue areas. We have one that looks at food access and nutrition, one that looks at farmers and institutional purchasing, another one looking at food waste and food waste packaging, one looking at planning and zoning, and then we had an ad hoc committee for a couple years looking at pollinator um, policies that can preserve pollinator habitats. I always get a tongue tied when saying that one. And so we, uh, have been working for a couple years now. In 2014, we put together a policy agenda, which is another one of the uh, materials in front of you. And that is a very long list, but of some of our priority issue areas. And it's organized, as you see, by policy decision-making body. So on one side, you'll see there's county, fed, state, institutional, and then on the back side, there's municipal and school boards. We recognize that policies that impact the food system happen at so many different levels. And although we're a local body, we're the Washtenaw County Food Policy Council, and that's certainly the lens we take when engaging in policy, we recognize that policies that affect the food systems happen at multiple levels. Um, so we engage in those when appropriate. And we look at a bunch of different issue areas. And then we updated this in 2016. And so this is our kind of guiding document for uh, what issues we engage in. Um, but one thing that we wanted to update you on was the work we did last year in 2017 with financial support from Michigan State University's Center for Regional Food System. And we undertook a strategic planning process to look at our internal and external engagement for the council. We'd been around for five years at that time. We had made a lot of progress in terms of establishing ourselves and setting up procedures and really wanted to have a, a moment to take a pause and look at how we were doing in terms of articulating our work and how we engaged participating council members but also engaged community members with our work. 
And so that was a really valuable process. And out of that, there came a few additional projects, if you will, for the year. Uh, in addition to the ongoing work that we are committed to doing through our policy agenda, we are looking at a couple of different small projects that I wanted to update you on. Uh, some have to do with our internal organization. So one is looking at our financial structure. We have become a vibrant group and we really wanna make sure we're able to respond to opportunities for funding pro small projects, collaborating with partners, and we really just wanna make sure we have the financial structure that supports our ability to do that. So we're assessing what that would need to look like um, so that way um, we have that, that procedure in place that everyone feels comfortable with. And then another thing is setting up a formal system of accountability. So that way, both internally and externally, people know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what those, those, um, uh, the impact we're hoping to have is. Uh, the second kind of project area is looking at relationships with decision makers, focusing primarily on elected officials and administrators at all levels, so city, county, state, federal. Uh, we know relationship uh, building has, has uh, it's a two-way street, so we're wanting to both have the ear of our elected officials, so that way, um, if we have a concern about something related to the food system, we have that relationship established. And then we're also hoping to be a resource for our elected officials. There are so many issues around the food system happening and policy um, at all of those levels, and we really want to make sure we are visible in there as a resource for our elected officials. We know no one can be an expert on everything, and things get really complicated within the food system, and we have a lot of experts here on the ground that we always like to be able to um, connect people to. And then lastly, a kind of priority project for the year is looking at community engagement. Um, and one, one way we're really just tackling that was with community awareness. So how do we increase the visibility of the Washtenaw County Food Policy Council? We know not everyone's gonna be able to come to every meeting or even work group, uh, but really just making sure people know that we exist and how to connect with us. So that's what we've been working on and we are um, excited for the next, the next five years. It's amazing uh, that we've been around since 2012. I was able to start participating in 2013 when I moved from California. Uh, I moved to Ann Arbor, I didn't have a job, but I did food policy work, so I said I'm gonna start volunteering and participating and I, they haven't kicked me out yet. So um, it's been great and uh, I, I wanted to keep the overview brief just so you could see the overall arc where we've been the last couple of years. And um, if Chair Morgan permits, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that overview. That is extremely helpful to have some of that background. Um, I assume there are probably some questions. Does anyone have questions? Com uh, Commissioner Dietrich? Um, well, once again, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm, I'm lucky to serve on the Food Policy Council, and it's exciting, enriching, and I think does some really important work with um, our legislators, helping um, Representative Adam Zemke get the 10 cents a meal uh, program, which provided matching funds for um, school lunches in three Ann Arbor school districts. Ann Arbor, and, Ipsy, and, uh, Ipsy Dexter. and Dexter, right? Um, three, sorry, three Washaw County school districts. Um, and um, as another happy California transplant, although a little longer ago than, than you are, um, yeah, getting involved with food policy is really, really helpful. I was wondering if you would mind talking just a little bit more about the changes that are being considered to the financial structure. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for Because I question. think that the board um, would probably like to hear about that. Thank Absolutely. you. So, and to distinguish our financial structure from our organizational structure, we actually really very much appreciate our current organizational structure being a committee recognized by the board, having many, we have 15 different um, members right now that represent all different sectors of the food system, geographies, backgrounds, et cetera. So that organizational structure, how we make decisions, our bylaws we like. I think we don't have a financial scaffolding, if you will, that allows us to receive and spend funds. And so we are exploring a couple different options. One is to be have some sort of line item in somewhere in the county, whether that's within the Board of Commissioners or a specific department where there we could, um, if we were able to apply for a mini grant, house you know, two or two thousand or five thousand dollars, and then uh, pay for small projects through that. Another option is uh, being housed within an existing nonprofit, um, for example, food gatherers or United Way or some other more kind of neutral, if you will, nonprofit. Um, that would be purely acting as fiscal sponsor, but not directing the work, um, the organizational work and the the, the vision and the execution of the work would still be done um, as currently structured. 
Thank but we you. are still in that investigatory process. We are um, we have a small little ad hoc working group looking into a couple of different options, and we're going to present that to our um, council at the May 14th meeting. I forget what that second Monday is. I think it's the 14th, whatever that date is. We're presenting it there, and then we'll have a discussion about that. So we're looking to to keep moving forward on that. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Actually, a follow up with Commissioner Dietrich's question. It, Where's the, and maybe I missed this, the primary source of the Food Council's funding coming from? There is no funding. So we are a body of volunteers, um, and so there is no funding. So uh, most people are participating in a voluntary capacity. Um, I have the you know unique overlap with my day job and our role um, as food gatherers and in, um, investment in kind of food policy in the food system. So I participate on, on behalf of my role at food gatherers, and there's a couple of others who participate um, through their role um, in terms of their day job, if you will, but there is no funding. Um, that said, there are a couple of projects that align with the work of the Food Policy Council. So for instance, uh, food gatherers, I'll just keep using us as an example for illustrative purposes, we were able to apply for a grant from the Center for Regional Food System to test a tool to measure food access. Um, in the county. They were modeling, uh, developing a tool to measure share, it's a shared measurement tool to measure food access throughout the state. And they applied, they asked people to apply, but they wanted people that were connected to food policy councils and could both gather the input and share the findings. And so that was a project where food gatherers applied for the funding and executed the project, but it, it was aligned with the goals um, and the current priorities of the council. So that's currently how most of the work gets done is, is there another entity who uh, can lead this work and execute it. Um, sorry, uh, Commissioner Brabeck, but the, uh, is there any barrier to sort of pursuing grants or funding being part of the county? It seems like we, we have different parts of the county applying for grants all the time, but is there any barrier to that? I think it would be primarily just setting up a protocol and knowing what those parameters are in terms of do we need pre-approval to apply for funding, do we only need approval to accept funding and spend funding, what are the barriers in terms of how many um, invoices can be paid and what the turnaround time is for all of those things. So it's kind of more just those those uh, procedures, those financial procedures that we would need to understand. Are, they, are there any activities or contracts that would be limited, restricted, et cetera? Oh, okay. Uh, Commissioner Ribbeck? Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's along the same line of questioning. If, if you were to have funding from somewhere, mm -hmm. what kinds of projects would you envision lining up with what you've outlined from, or that you learned from the strategic planning process that you could do, uh, you know, besides the grants that you might get and then push back out to the community? Yep. So a bunch of different things have to do everything from data and research, so like a, a, a community-based survey or doing some data collection and assessment, trying to do a better understanding of what those uh, kind of metrics are or data are on the ground. So that often just takes time, right? And even just a small subcontract to someone to pay for their time to better understand that data. Um, and then there's also policy-related projects. So right now, we are working to put together a letter to Senator Stabenow about the Farm Bill. Mm -hmm. um, and we're working with a couple other counties, um, food policy councils, and we're fortunate enough to be just connected to a, a graduate student who's helping us connect with the work. Um, and doing all that legwork in terms of putting together a polished letter. Um, so some, it's all just kind of small little projects like that. Marketing, thinking about someone's time to do social media or staff events or do put together special materials, et cetera. So it's all small, small stuff. There's not any huge kind of expense items that we foresee, at least at, at the current scale. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Appreciate your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Martin. Thank you. Uh, next up is our county administrator with the eye on the feature document. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you, Chair. Uh, tonight I bring you the eye on the future document. You've seen this document many times. Uh, it is our opportunity to present to you some of the challenges that we all know you face around the budget. Many of these challenges are external pressures that impact your decisions around the budget and our resources. We have, uh, we've done, we did this, this presentation last week at the Group of 180, and I was surprised to hear that so many of my colleagues 
had questions about the, what was going on in our external environment. So I'm going to walk you through some of this this evening. And uh, some of this you've seen many times. Some of this will likely disappear from this document in the future. Uh, but many of these items are on our radar or dashboard for future discussion with all of you. Uh, beginning with some of the things that we have accomplished over the last few years, I think you all remember that uh, the, the State Court of Appeals dismissed a complaint against us that we were violating Hed Headley with, our, uh, with collecting our unvoted millages. Uh, that was a huge win for us. Uh, we had some concern about what those impacts would be if we were to lose that case. Very pleased about that. We will likely drop that bullet from this presentation in the future. Uh, moving on, animal control, we, we did a lot of work last year. Thank you to all of you for approving uh, that, uh, that solution. Uh, that was a solution that we agreed that we would continue to, to evaluate and monitor moving forward. I'm pleased to tell you that we continue to receive better, more granular data from uh, the Huron Valley uh, Animal Control uh, Organization. That data is is continuing to be evaluated, is continue, will continue to provide you with ongoing reporting and updated information, excuse me. <clears throat> Moving along to community corrections, in 2016, this board took action via a resolution to increase funding in that area. Uh, we identified, it, identified a gap in funding in that area, worked with the Sheriff's Office to increase that budget, and the Sheriff's Office continues to work with us to, to manage and monitor those services. And then finally, state liquor tax. This is an area where we re received a 50% cut again in 2016, and you all took action to fill that gap moving forward. And uh, again, that is something that cre from our external environment that created pressures for all of you, uh, you know, as you move forward with conversations around the budget. Continuing on, economic development in 20, 2017, we, we stopped levying Act 88 and made the decision to fund uh, those programs and services uh, during the 2018 year. We, we, we looked at that as stopgap funding, funding for us to, to take a, a larger, more strategic look at, at those services that were covered under Act 88. We expect to bring you back uh, an updated uh, funding model later this year along with that some, some modifications to the Office of Community and Economic Development. Ro the, these next three bullets, I'd I, I like to talk about them uh, in aggregate. You know, if you look at the road funding millage, veterans relief, and community, the, the millage that, that you guys passed this year, they total over $24 million. And on behalf of the organization, the community, I thank you guys for your leadership in getting those, those millages passed. Uh, the challenge for us moving forward is, is that it, that is $24 million that we've moved down a structural path with, and those dollars aren't structural dollars. Those dollars have an end in mind, and if the voters don't choose to renew those millage dollars, then we have a gaping hole in our budget. So again, as we think about these things, I think we need to be forward thinking, and, and, and we need to make certain that, that we have an eye on on creating solutions for many of these things moving forward. Some anticipated impacts for, th for the next four-year cycle, they're listed above. I'll walk you through those fairly quickly. You've seen all of these before. They continue to be on our radar our dashboard as items that we need a strategic solution around. Headley, I don't need to say a whole lot about this. Uh, this continue, this uh, continues to be at the forefront of our challenges around revenue. I continue to say to the organization and our stakeholders that we have a revenue issue in the state of Michigan and it impacts our community on the local level. For, for, for 2017, 2016 and 17, the last two years, uh, that has cost us a million dollars in structural resources. We have we have a, a budget figure for the next four years, but again, it, it, that's a challenge for us moving forward and, and it continues to be uh, on the minds of, of, of our finance team and our administrative team just in terms of, of, of trying to, to seek solutions. Unfunded liabilities, we've had a number of conversation, 
conversations around that. In, in my mind, the, the big piece there is that, you know, we have funding levels, we've established targets. Uh, you can see our funding levels listed there. It's going to be important for us to look at a couple of things moving forward. Uh, one is uh, our funding levels. Uh, you know, we, we have these targets. We've, make, we've made some incremental ads over the years. If we continue to do that, uh, we will continue to move the needle in that, in, in that area, provided the following. One, we continue to monitor our actuarial data. And two, we have uh, strong oversight over our investments. I know there's a couple of commissioners in the room that sit on our, our, our WERS board, our WERS and Bieber boards. It's important that we continue to provide that stewardship and we continue to make sure that we maximize our investments. Capital needs, thank you for uh, your action last evening. Uh, your action last evening just continues down this path of making certain that we do everything possible to keep our uh, infrastructure operating at a high level. Uh, you can see some of the impacts of reducing our commitment to our infrastructure over the years. Uh, in today's dollars, uh, it would, uh, an eighth of a mil, which is our operating dollars, would produce $1.9 million. We are funding at $1.1 million. So you, you can see that there is about an 800, 800 plus thousand dollar shortfall in annual capital building maintenance. In addition to that, there are capital projects that we had been funding at a, a woefully low rate. I'm almost embarrassed by the $25,000 that we put in that fund on an annual, annual basis. Best practices say that capital funding should be anywhere between 15 and 20% of your overall operating budget. So you can imagine where we're at in terms of our infrastructure. So those are things that we'll have to, to decide as we move forward if we were to uh, to allocate the full eighth of a mil you can see the impact listed below for 2019 2020 and 21 moving on we've talked a lot about our non-general fund units uh, you know with the exception of cmh uh, we have had a number of conversations with public health and oced they have significant challenges we have kept their funding flat and in and, and just in terms of them keeping up with, with wage pressures with their staff, you can see, you can see the impact that, that it has when we keep their, their revenues flat. They, it, over time, it just simply erodes their programming. So we, we know we owe you a solution around that. We continue to, to want to work with those two department heads to, to try to develop solutions that make sense for us uh, and that again, needs to be a component of our, our discussions around the four-year budget process. You can see listed below the impacts if we were to fund at, at, the, uh, at the appropriate or asked level for 19, 20, and 21. You can see those dollar figures below, and, and they're, they're quite sta staggering in my mind. Uh, so health and human services, a lot of talk about that. We, we want to make sure uh, that uh, we have we fund those operations at the appropriate level uh, and that we, we make strategic investments moving forward. I won't say a whole lot about that except to say we, we owe you uh, some updates as we move forward in, in this fiscal year. The Office of Community and Economic Development, uh, we are going to take a, a, a full look at their operations, recommend some changes and modifications uh, to, to, that, to that group moving forward. They continue to face a number of pressures from both the state and federal level. Uh, we would like to bring to you a solution that does a little bit to mitigate those impacts, but of course, those are challenges at the federal, federal or state level that we have very little control of. Uh, the, the general fund impact for 2019 and beyond of $121,000, uh, we've taken some action, some, some temporary action to, to close that gap for fiscal year 2018. But of course, as we move through the four-year budget process, we will we'll need to plug that particular hole. Platte Road, uh, we continue. Curtis is, is leaving is leading that discussion. Uh, we continue to work with the the uh, recommended vendor uh, on a solution moving forward. We expect to bring something back to you during the month of of May, just in terms of an update. Court cost revenues, we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, you know, the case filings are down countywide. 
and our ability to, to address uh, the, the current revenue targets it, it, it is a challenge for us. Uh, you, you know that there's some legislation that, that has been adopted and if it moves through uh, the, the House, will, that'll create a, another huge hole in our budget. The potential general fund impact if that legislation moves forward would be about $1.1 million beginning in fiscal year 2021. So again, as we look to the future, that's an area that we need to continue to monitor and continue to think about what those impacts will mean for us moving forward. District court revenues, uh, you know, I was ahead of myself on that last slide, but in talking about district court revenues, we know the case filings are down. We know that we've kept their, rev their revenue projections flat over the years, and those two things are out of sync. And sometime later this year, we expect to bring to you again uh, a solution for that. And, and the general fund impact continues to be anywhere between a half million and $900,000 annually. Talent develop, development, this is a new initiative. We rolled it out at, at, a, at a more complete or comprehensive level at the Group of 180 last week, very well received. To this point, we have not assigned any permanent resources to that initiative. We will bring that back to you as well. These last few slides, try to take a look at all of those things uh, in aggregate if, if we look at capital needs and, and those cost increases from our non-general fund programs the Office of Community and Economic Development just carrying forward that $121,000 over the next three years. And of course, fill in, plugging that hole with uh, district court revenues, you can see what those impacts will be for 19, 20, and 21. And then finally, this is to me a, a, an alarming graph. If you look out to 2027, you start to see a huge gap between uh, our, our, our revenues and expenditures. And as I talk to the finance team, they tend to not be as alarmed as I am. And you think you look at this from a macro level and you say, well, we have a $10 million structural hole in the budget. But there's some assumptions that are aligned with that that, that we hope to mitigate over, over the next few years that will bring that down. There are some major assumptions around that that we'll bring back to you later this year as a component of the budget process and you'll see that we have some opportunity to, to uh, close many of the gaps that, that, that are starting to grow beginning in, in fiscal year 2020. So I know that was fast and furious. A, a number of uh, major initiatives outlined in this document, uh, and I'll entertain any questions that you have. If I can't answer them directly tonight, I'll make certain that you get uh, a, a complete response in the, in the coming days. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, Commissioner Smith, you're up first. Didn't, uh, um, that's the last, <laughs> last slide you put up, right? Yeah. <laughs> about this growing gap. Can you talk a little bit about the assumptions that go into that? A um, couple of things I'm particularly curious about is <coughs> um, the, the rise and drop in total expenditures uh, from 19 to 20 to 21. Um, so there's an, uh, an anomalous year there, and I don't understand what that is. Yeah, so there's two components of that, and, and I'll, again, I'll get you guys a more complete answer, but as, as I, I understand it, you know, we have a planned use of fund balance in year 20 and 21, and there's, there's a, some fluctuation there. And the, the other key assumption is that we are budgeting for uh, staff revenues at 98%. And when you think about what our actuals are. What is that? I don't know. What is that? So we budget for 98% of our, our positions to be filled. Uh oh, I see. Yeah, and when you look at the reality around that, it's something far less than that. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are two of the key assumptions. I'll get you a, a full list of the assumptions around that, around that slide and get yeah. that out to the full board. That'd be helpful. I mean, one of the things that we, you are famous for um, is budgeting our, our revenues extremely conservatively, um, which I assume is one of the assumptions this long-term projection, um, and we have also very consistently outperformed that revenue projection. So we absolutely have. The further out you yeah. get, you right. know, the worse that looks. The worse it looks, yeah. And, and to, to that point, uh, that is why, uh, from a finance perspective, when I talk to the staff down there, they're less concerned about that. We have a history of being purposely conservative in those in those uh, projections. 
I have a hundred other questions, but I'm going to take a minute to develop. Okay. Them. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Greg, for this. Um, I would, wanted to talk about the unfunded liabilities, and uh, I, I just have a couple of questions thinking about, again, our budget. I know that we have the funding levels through um, 2016. Do we have ones for 2017? Not yet. We plan to bring bring that data back to you. I, I don't know the the actual date that they're due. We'll, we'll, we're, well, I mean, we we get a, a basically a monthly update. Right. Yeah. But, uh, uh, we do an annual. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. What's that word? So we get Audit. to figure out what the dead people are. Yeah. 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 Mortality yeah. table, the mortality rates, yeah. actual, actual, actual actuarial actual data. Yeah. So, so there, <laughs> so, yeah. so we do get them on a regular basis, but we do this kind of annual right. uh, report. We'll we'll get that out to you as well, and that that'll be a component, as I talked about, of bringing back to you guys a strategy or a strategy recommendation uh, around our, our liabilities sure. and, and and hoping to move the needle and move the move the, those, so those funds up. Yep. Do we yes. know? Um, from the three of you who are there, if if those numbers that you were seeing in those reports generally, I know you don't know them right now, but like generally, are they going up? Mm -hmm. Are they staying flat? So was, I was mm -hmm. also then wondering about the return. Our uh, uh, unfunded liability is decreasing. Currently okay, great. Because yeah. that's great. So, so the, our returns are getting are yeah are our growing. Re our returns high. are outperforming are our expectations. Are, yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. That, that's one component of it, and, and as you all know, we have made the decision as a part of our budget process to make some incremental adds. And, and while they're right, small, right. as long as we're outperforming our numbers, that adds to it. Okay. So, yeah. okay. I think Commissioner uh, Labar had a comment. Yeah, just just to that point, the on the words board with, with VIBA, we, we have had a good run in terms of returns. Uh, I don't know what the last few months will do to that. It probably won't yeah. skew it too much. Right. And Conan, I, I think the last numbers we saw were roughly in line with what's listed here, the 73, 53, and 76. I mean, it, 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 it wouldn't deviate uh, noticeable. We haven't dipped yeah. further below. Yeah. Okay. And, and Commissioner okay. Barr, to that end, I, when I looked at it when we were putting it together, I think you're, you're spot on with, with those numbers being very, very close to what, what's presented okay. in that slide. So that, so those, um, what did you call it? The actuarial mm -hmm. data should come mm -hmm. back to us relatively soon. I, I'm also wanting to have right. it for our budget. For the budget right. planning discussion. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You get it in May. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, could you, I'm sorry that um, my brain is not working faster, but on slide eight, um, those, the numbers that you have there for 19, 20, 21 at the bottom, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not understanding what those numbers are. Can you, can you, Justin, can you put number? The, so it's on our, it's slide eight, page four. Justin, would you mind putting the presentation back up? So is that the, the additional, like if we have current staffing the same, that because of benefit packages and things, this is the additional amount that it will cost? That's the additional For amount. those departments. For those departments. Okay. Yeah. And that's not adding any additional, is that assuming that all roles are filled or no? It's always assuming that, that all positions are filled. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and so, as I talked about earlier, when we don't do that, all we do is erode the programming in those areas. Right, sure. We're, we're yeah. not funded at the appropriate sure. level. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I just have one more question, I'm sorry. The, you mentioned that a best practice for Infrastructure is 15 to 20 percent of the budget. Is that like that? Just seems so. That seems really difficult to do year after year, when we have it's, so many programmatic. Well, which needs. is why the, reasonable. the United States, as as a as a cool. nation, it, our infrastructure is failing all over the place, right? because we have 
disinvested in our infrastructure over the years. I mean, we had our, our portfolio, I believe if I looked at the last numbers, is, va is valued at over $400 million. And you can mm -hmm. see what we invest in our, mm -hmm. in our infrastructure on, a, on an annual. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Commissioner Dietrich. Thank you, Chair. I think Commissioner Brabeck actually asked a lot of <laughs> my questions, which is great. Um, so going back, I'm just going to kind of go through this page by page. Um, going back to the unfunded liabilities for legacy costs, just um, this may be a question for you or for our, our commissioners who sit on these um, board this committee. Um, so our return on investment, that's related to how we're doing in the stock market, right? And so the increases in these funding levels, if any, from 2016 would be related to that. We're not chipping in lots of extra money as accounts. So if we have a problem if we have a problem with the stock market, which given the volatile socioeconomic condition. Right. Yep. Right. Okay. Our, our, our we could actually end up will... with the stock market not keeping up with the rate right. of inflation and we mm -hmm. could fall behind. That's we could fall behind. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that correct or no? Yeah. I'm, I'm, if the chair is okay with it, I would be, be happy to have other people chip in and, and answer. Yeah. So just briefly. Um, Part of our contribution every year is uh, what we call the ARC, the actuarial required contribution that does come from the general fund. We make that ARC every year, um, unlike many governments. <laughs> um, we, are, uh, we have always um, paid in the amount that we are actuarially required to pay in. Um, in 2008, 2009, like every other government, like we got hammered when the stock market declined. And then since then, we have been on the, the uptick. A few years ago, we changed our uh, investment assumptions and changed the, the timeline for paying out over that actuarial table. Now, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our uh, earning ta earnings target is seven and a quarter percent across the entirety of correct. the yes. portfolio. Yeah. So it's it's actually quite modest for the uh, investment level that we make. Remember, we're investing $250 million. So we get to buy into the best advice and the best funds because we have so much money on the, the table. So, How is that, that diversified in terms of risk levels? Because uh, that is, it is. Extraordinarily, yeah. So we have, high. what, I mean, I mean yeah. seven or eight different um, uh, sectors that we're investing in. So we have, um, you know, large cap, but we also have a lot of bonds. We hold right now three or $4 million in cash, essentially. So, uh, yeah, it, it runs the full gamut. That, uh, that entire portfolio is reported on every month, and it's on the county website. If you just, um, if you Google from the homepage for WERS or WCERS, you can get the monthly update. And Michelle, it shows you uh, each of the individual funds, um, and then the total portfolio's diversification in terms of how much weight we're putting into each one and their performance by, by each fund. So the ARC, that contribution, is that substantial? Yes, mm -hmm. 20 million. Yeah, and we're required to make that fund, but to, uh, so I, I heard your question different, Commissioner Dietrich, and it is about performance. And our performance yes. will go with the market. Right. So if we're, we have expectations that include a certain <clears throat> performance level, and we don't, because we are gonna have, listen, you, you know, it's the cyclical, the cyclical nature, nature of the market, the next downturn will have some level of impact on, uh, you know, our investments. So for us, you know, what's our policy say? And I, I think that's the central question for all of you. What what do you what does your policy say? And what are the funding levels that uh, you'd like to see moving forward? Okay, so go. I'm fine with it if Commissioner Smith would like to, I, I yield to you. Yeah, I would just uh, like yeah. to say too, when I think when Andy was the Ways and Means Chair, I think, um, you brought a professor from Eastern Michigan University to the board who had, what was that before that? I, just to interrupt, it was the summer of 2013 when we were discussing bonding, bonding. and it was at yes. the working session. 
So one of the strategies that is available to us is to issue um, uh, a bond to cover our unfunded liability and take those funds. So say our unfunded liability is $300 million. We bond for $300 million. We take that cash. We, we now have zero unfunded liability because it's, it's funded. It's just funded from a debt perspective. Because we have a AAA bond rating, we borrow it, say, 1% or 2%, and we dump that $300 million into WERS and VIBA, uh, and they invest it at, at their you know, target rate of 7.25%. That arbitrage benefit then covers our actuarially required exactly. contribution. Yeah, yeah. It, and that's what we, I'm sorry. It's okay. No, but sorry. It, it also would reduce, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, reduce our flexibility in terms of being able to bond other things, correct? To just still keep our bond yes, rating in, well, right? Our bond capacity is more than a billion dollars. So, I mean, we would, yeah, I don't think we would ever borrow to our bond capacity. I mean, That's essentially what we were studying the last, the right. last time. We missed an opportunity. So, um, unless Commissioner Smith or Labar has something have something else to add, no, that was very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, moving on to the capital and infrastructure needs, I'm just going to press a little on the idea of an eighth of a mill. I, I guess um, do we really need to meet that? I mean, I mean, I guess it's just, it is a lot of money. I hear we, you can always spend more on infrastructure. And I'm, it's just, um, so if, if we had more than the 25K per year, which is very small for capital projects, yeah. what would we use it for? We would use it for our capital needs. And we have a few that are coming up. If you have traveled to t the Towner Center, there's a parking lot staff parking lot that needs to be replaced. That's a significant dollar amount. We have roof replacements. Those are significant components of it. We have a parking need in the downtown area that we'll have to resolve one way or another. Those are the kinds of things that uh, we, we would, we would uh, use those dollars for. Servicing the debt, one strategy will be, listen, we have capital needs that will, I'll, I'll put a number out there, approach $20 million. If we are funding our capital account at an appropriate, at an appropriate level, it could service the debt on uh, our capital needs. To your other point about where, whether we really need to fund the eighth of a mill at that level, we have made the choice as an organization to not do that. And we are continuing down that path. Now, if you, you'll, you'll hear in a couple of weeks from Dave and the OIM staff and they'll tell you that that's not a sustainable model. Uh, but we have made that choice because we have had to, because our revenues have been challenged. We have programmatic needs that we have placed a higher priority on. That is a fundamental decision that we're going to have to make as an organization. So I hear what you're saying. Uh, we'll have to make a choice to continue the funding uh, level that we currently have or look at uh, that larger number in the future. I guess. What I would say about infrastructure is, is and I'm, I'm, I know this is already happening, but I hope we use all of our dollars at whatever level we can fund it very wisely mm -hmm. and on the highest priority items, certainly roofs, yeah. um, right? Yes, yeah. Safe, safety for staff, I mean, those kinds of things don't, don't, aren't lost on, I know all of you and certainly myself, you know, we have uh, safety needs throughout our courts, safety needs throughout our buildings and our infrastructure, making sure that our lighting is appropriate in our parking lots, uh, safety and security in, in some of our, on some of our campuses. All those things have a higher priority than some of the more cosmetic things that we do. But we do have some cosmetic components that are on a schedule. For example, the organization has a, a, a fairly comprehensive carpet replacement schedule and, and you know, that's a, that's a choice that we make as an organization. And what we, what we like to do is take a look and, and, and make some assumptions that are inconsistent with just having a standard where we're going to replace carpet. I'll use this room as an example every 15 years. We do some analysis uh, in, in year 14 to say we can get five more years out of that. That stretches our dollars. 
We have to make similar assumptions around technology. We fund those things that we know uh, continue to, to create a robust infrastructure, but we also need to fund those things that keep that keeps our data and networks safe. So those are the kinds of things that we ought to look at. Um, and again, uh, safety and security of staff is is a higher is a higher priority than some of those other cosmetic things. I would definitely agree with that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I was listening to you, so I'm trying to see if there are any other notes I made that about with questions that haven't already been answered. You mentioned opportunities for closing that are possible for closing the gap between revenues and expenditures going forward. Can you mention just at a very, very high level what some of those might be? Are you thinking about like animal control or? Animal control is, is an area there. We have to continue. So when, I talk, when we talk to department heads, we always talk about their programmatic needs and we always talk about them in a strategic way. But we have to continue to maintain what I would call downward pressure on our operating costs. And if there are ways, opportunities for collaboration, opportunities to become more efficient across departments, those are the things that we absolutely must do. Because as, as, as Conan and I think many of you mentioned, when you look at that graph, we have some assumptions. They're conservative assumptions. But we all know the cost of doing business continues to rise. L wage costs continue to rise. We're in a, a hyper-competitive, that's the way I describe it, uh, labor market here in Washtenaw County. Uh, and we, we enjoy that, but at the same time, as a, as, a, as a large employer, it creates some challenges for us. So uh, not lost on me is this need to, to close the gap on or reduce a, or create that pressure that, that reduces our operating costs because we know we have caps on our revenue. Uh, we have a revenue, revenue problem in Washtenaw County, not a, an operating or expenditure issue in Washtenaw County. For the most part, as you can see, uh, you just took action last week. We st everyone stayed within their budgets, and we had a surplus at the end of the year. To me, that that implies that we're operating at a very high level. We're staying within our within our, our budget mandates, but that continues to be a challenge year over year because of those pressures that we just talked about. Revenues are capped, and you know when you, when you start to overlay the 24 million dollars in slide number one. With, with the millages that we've been successful around, there is the potential for those to go away. And what impacts do, the, do those create? It would be great, and you know, I, I'll choose my words wisely here, it would be great if the state of Michigan would fund our roads appropriately. Because if they funded our roads appropriately, there, there's $7.3 million on an annual basis that we could plow into other services in Washtenaw County. So those are the kinds of things on our external environment that have a significant impact on the choices that the nine of you have to make year over year with our budgets. Well, there's no doubt that, um, yes, uh, state could do better, and, and there's no doubt in my mind that, that every other one of the 83 counties in, in Michigan is facing the same issues that we are with, with revenues. Um, I think I'll hold on to any further questions for a minute and let someone else have a chance. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Labar? Thanks, Chair. Um, I think those are some good questions that Commissioner Dietrich had asked. And uh, just on that, on the eighth of a mill, I remember when I first came on in 2013, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, we'd put off the eighth of the mill in 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. And so one way to think of it is we've had We've had that, we've had that responsibility sort of uh, put off for a decade almost, and I think we've been justified in doing that at times. But I do think we've also been lucky that we haven't had a major infrastructure failure. Yes. And so, I, you know, that's that's just one thing to think of is um, beyond the maintenance issue, what happens when uh, something happens. Um, on the on, on two things first if you look at page eight if you look at the revenue graph Greg I think you said Washington County has 
uh, a revenue problem, not an expenditure problem. And I, and I agree. I think you later amended it to include the state of Michigan in the context of roads. This, this isn't by accident. This is what they wanted to do with Headley. This is what they wanted to do with Proposal A. This is what they wanted to do uh, in eliminating the, uh, the ability of locals to raise business taxes and what they've done in terms of reneging on their agreements on revenue sharing. And so this isn't going to get better unless there's a uh, change in Lansing. And I think um, the only reason I'm harping on that is uh, we've got to find a way to be able to communicate to our citizenry that it's, it's structurally set up to fail. And um, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to do that because uh, there's only so much bad news folks can take. The sad thing is, if you if you took these graphs and these numbers, uh, especially our, our revenue expenditure side, and our uh, very much our unfunded liabilities, if you put them around pure counties in the state of Michigan or pure uh, levels of government around the nation, folks, we look fantastic. Exactly. And that is not to say we don't have great challenges. It's, 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 it's to prove the overall uh, point of, of just how tough it is out there. Um, the, I guess the, the question I have for you, Greg, is if nothing changes, structurally in the state of Michigan. Do we ever get to a point where we need to uh, fundamentally revisit the ability of our county uh, to, to do anything? Do we need to look at the charter process? Does that afford us any additional options? Um, do we need to change our plan? Because if you look at this page eight graph, it only goes to 2027. If you extrapolate it out to 2040, all of a sudden, if it follows the same trend lines, you're talking about a 40% shortfall between uh, revenue and expenditure. At that point, county government in Washington County is a fundamentally different question. And I just wonder, um, does staff ever think about that sort of worst case scenario? And how do we keep that in the back of our minds? I hope it never happens. but. It, it might. Well, so you, you said a lot in that, and, 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 I, and I, I made some notes. Let me try to cover all that. So I, I love the way you phrase that. We are set up to fail. We, we have capped revenues. We know if, if, we, if we do nothing and just try to do our best to keep up with the cost of doing business, we slowly erode our service delivery model. Our headcount has remained largely flat over the years. We're not growing our FTE base. Uh, we are attempting to live within the means that we have. And if our revenue uh, position does not change, we will just, by virtue of the way things are configured in this state, slowly erode our ability to provide these services. And, you, you know, when you talk about what we think about in administration and with senior leadership at at the department head level, et cetera, it is what can we do as a county, as a community, to resolve our revenue issues? That is something that we're going to have to face at some point in time. Now, I'm hopeful that, you know, over the course of the years, as, as things change in Lansing, perhaps the landscape and the funding uh, architecture in the state will change. That's me being optimistic, uh, I hope that happens. But for us, at some point, we're going to have to have a frank and candid discussion about with the community about what their values are and how we can align those values with our shrinking resources. The, the only other thing I'd say, and then I'll, I, no need to follow up to this, but the other thing working against us and Conan, I bet you'd, you've seen this in your, in your tenure as, as the regulations around how we have to account have changed. We are 
we are told to account essentially in a, in a, in a business model that fundamentally disagrees with our mission. Um, and so, you know, when, when first on the board, I think everybody at this table basically says, I want to provide services to people, right? I want to, I want to do things for citizens. Um, and you're penalized for that to some degree in county government right now. And so that's, uh, that's another little nugget of sunshine to keep in the back of our minds. Um, so look, uh, with that negative uh, assessment, uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you for uh, keeping us sober. Here, if you don't mind, just two really quick hitters because, uh, you know, Andy, you, you really said a mouthfeel full with a, with a number uh, of items. And, you know, back to the, the infrastructure piece, I fully understand why we did what we did uh, with, the dis with reducing our funding around the infrastructure. It was the right thing to do because it became a function of people and services versus continuing to uh, fund our infrastructure at the current level. I get all of that. And we made some difficult choices. Those choices will have caused us to grow our deferred maintenance. And that's the result of, of, of making those decisions. At some point in time, that catches up with us. And the last thing that I'd say to the point that Commissioner Smith made, to me, that's an interesting we have an interesting opportunity with, with, with uh, our legacy costs that at some point in time we should likely at least have a conversation around. Uh, I, I think at some point we're going to be forced to do that. And then the other piece is we ought to be thinking about a, a general operating millage. And again, you know, that's something that has to go to the voters. I understand that. But absent that, at some point we're going to have to face the difficult uh, choice uh, between services and staff in this county. Um, I have Commissioner Jamnick um, after, after a question. I'll be very brief. Um, the one thing I want to say is I think that um, I think you're on to something there, uh, Greg, er, Administrator, in terms of eventually potentially looking at some sort of operating millage, but what I think is really important for us to do before we even ever get to that point is really look at how we're showing our value to constituents and to residents, and which is why I, I sort of keep banging the drum for more community engagement, because I don't think the general public sees county government or sees the important work that we do or sees the amazing impact we make on people's lives. And so I really want us to start just continue talking about how we increase our, our communication and engagement with the public and bring them into the, some of the work that we're doing so we can show them, yes, we're doing really important work on your behalf. Yes, there's a lot more to do. In the future, we're going to need to find a way to work together with the community and potentially ask them for, for revenue to fund those important things. But if they aren't on board in the, the coming years to sort of see all of that work and understand the value of county government, we'll never get support for that. And I think you know that and I appreciate that and so I just want to make sure that we're really thinking about that. Uh, absolutely, if we can't generate value and if we can't communicate that value effectively, we're likely not going to be successful when we go out uh, to the community to ask for additional resources. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on. Absolutely, and then the um, one other question um, and it's just because it's the only question I didn't uh, quite get asked, I wanted to clarify in the capital and infrastructure needs. It says 20, 5K here, but we've been putting more than that into infrastructure, right? We so we put more into the industry. Yes, 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 we have. Yes, and that's not lost on, on me as well. And uh, again, what we've done to make up for that at year end, we've made those recommendations and you guys have approved those recommendations. So in a, in, in a non-structural way, we're, we're addressing some of those capital needs. Would, one of the things, would you be able to show us sort of what we've actually invested in infrastructure over the past several years um, to just see, you know, yeah. regardless yes. of what we've committed to it structurally, to see what we've actually put into it? Because I think it is, it seems to be working fairly well yep. to put in some yep. additional revenue mm -hmm. at the end of the year um, to that infrastructure and to prioritize things at that point. Um, but I was just curious to see you know, at what level yeah. we've actually been funding. We'll, we'll get you that. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions I had. Thank you very much for, this has been a great presentation. Um, Commissioner Jamnick, I had you up next. 
Well, I agree with Andy. My concern is as we move forward, where will the money come from? I mean, we have some communities that are doing very well at the people that live in them and their homes and stuff like that. But there are communities that if we decide we're going to ask for another middle age and stuff, those kinds of things, there are some of the communities that cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So I am very concerned about, and I have been, for the things that we do fund that aren't necessarily going to better the whole county. I understand we have to look at people that need help, and, and we do a really good job of that. But we are, and it isn't just here, it's across the state, it's across the country, where communities are, are putting themselves into debt. They're spending down some of the reserves that they have, and, or whatever, they, however they want to call them. That's my concern. That's my concern, because my district, there are some affluent people, but there are a lot of people that are not, that own their homes, that pay their taxes and do those things, and I'm sure every community in our, our county has the same kind of population. We don't have necessarily the jobs that we had before, so we have people that are, that are struggling and there are people that are not struggling whatsoever at all. But I'm, that's my concern as we go forward, that we have to remember there's going to, at some point, in the current administration in Washington, that isn't looking out for the little people. And that's my concern. And I want us to be able to continue to do the good things that we are doing and I think we have this, I think we are at a point where we really need to start digging down into that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I just want to echo what, uh, what the chair said this evening about engaging our community. I, you know, I, I, as we think about how we move forward and how we lead this organization, there's one area that I think we need to invest a, a, a great deal of resources in, and that is the engagement in our community. What good is it to do the good work and not be able to, to, to communicate it accurately and effectively? And to your point about uh, resources, if I don't, as a citizen, if I don't see value in the work that you're already doing, I'm likely not going to support uh, any, any additional ads. Uh, and so, I, again, I think we have to look at how we align what we're doing and the expectations of, of our community. And that, that implies that we're going to have some level of engagement. And we tend to have a small group of commissioners that have these conversations. And I really think this is something that we, I don't know if we have work sessions forever, forever on this, but I really think we need to understand the real financial situation that we're in and the one that we're looking at. There's going to be good times, we're going to be okay, but we don't have any guarantee that everything is going to be fine. And there are a lot of people that are currently relying on services from us to help them lift themselves up. And, and I don't, I just, I'm very concerned, I'm sincerely very concerned about this. That's my old treasurer head, okay? Noted. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brayback, did you have? Yeah, I just have one question. Greg, when you were talking about uh, general operating millage, so we already have one of those that we levy every year right now. Are you talking about a Headley override and bringing that to the voters? Something along the, those lines. I, I, I really don't know what we would call it at this point, but yes, yes, okay. in, in effect, that's to, what I'm asking to for. Levy to levy more. To levy more, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Commissioner Jim. We can do that. However, the people, there are people who cannot afford if we continue to raise the taxes on them. And we've been very fortunate over the years. Most of our communities have been very fortunate over the years. But if the county is facing this situation, there are a whole bunch of communities and people down here 
that are struggling too. Well, I fully understand that. Hopefully, I, I just use this as a small example. Hopefully, the state will step up and fund road, roads appropriately. Uh, and uh, if they were to, were to do that, we could get out of the business of funding roads in our community. And if you just replace those dollars and add it to the general fund, that's a significant programmatic ad, significant resource ad that could fund programming in the county. So there's some creative things that we could do uh, in the community without having a, 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 an additional burden on our residents. Yeah, yep, yeah, uh, as am I. I also am not looking to do that anytime in the near future. I just meant if that's ever a thing that's going to be on the horizon, yes. I think that engagement and that involvement with the community would be an important thing. Um, Commissioner Dietrich. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to echo the, the concern that, you know, anytime we raise property taxes to some extent, that's really um, a regressive tax. Yes. It gets passed on to renters um, in their rent. And, um, you know, the big corporate tax giveaway at the state level is, is really one of the things that should be uh, reversed, banned, outlawed, <laughs> burned at the stake, whatever you want to say. So um, a couple of questions or comments, I guess really one big one. So I'm thinking about the fact that we are relatively conservative, as people have said, in estimating our revenues every year. And so I guess typically, I'm new, but typically we are ending up with a a reasonably large gap between revenues and expenditures such that the revenues are greater by so many millions. And then we call those usually non-structural dollars, so we end up with a relatively large amount in non-structural dollars year to year, which is, a, is where we're plugging various holes. So that's an assumption we're making, is, yes. and that therefore we end up with larger amounts of non-structural dollars because we're having a very not very, but a conservative revenue projection model, right? And we could make different assumptions. We could. And Absolutely. And, and that changes the landscape considerably if, if we were to do that. Uh, you know, we have the equalization report coming ne at the next meeting. It's likely going to be favorable. Uh, I don't have any of the data, uh, but when I spoke to our equalization director, he said I would be smiling that night. So. So to your point, we could make some adjustments in, in, our, in our assumptions that would change the, the landscape significantly. That's a policy consideration that the nine of you will, will, will need to, to uh, undertake at some point. Right, as part of the budget process, the right, Commissioner Brabeck? And, yes. And that would perhaps allow us, if we're comfortable with it, to help deal with some of the staffing issues that we're looking at if we simply felt confident saying, projecting revenues a little bit less conservatively. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other comments. Uh, looking at, oh, um, Commissioner Smith. I just want to know at the time, um, just as an FYI. I, I'll, I'll be brief because I'm sure Greg will just say yes. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one of the things that um, could actually reduce our operating costs is to uh, invest in renewable energy generation here um, and there's abundant opportunity for that um, I think that should be part of this budget cycle so can, I, I, I'm gonna say more than yes I so yes and I have asked Dave and his team when they bring their state of the county presentation back to make sure that renewable energy and energy solutions are inclusive in that presentation because you're spot on. And generally, some of those things pay for themselves in record time and reduce our operating costs as we move forward. So, yes. I'm done. The, a question. <laughs> Commissioner Smith, my recollection, and of course the prices of things like solar panels in particular are changing, but my recollection is that people are seeing like a three-year turnaround time in terms of investment and, and payback for some renewables. I mean, it'll be worse because solar panel prices are going up. But. Yeah, I think right now because of the, the challenge with solar panels and the steel tariff in particular yeah, because right. all those panels sit on steel, um, I think we're looking at seven-year payback periods right now. Um, but seven years is... Yeah. I mean, 
still fantastic. It is, which is something I would like to say to the providers of broadband, that a two-year uh, payback is, is not a reasonable... Uh... Anyway. I, I would also put on the table, though, um, that assumes that we capitalize the entire project ourselves, um, and we really could be doing public-private partnerships and, and creating um, power purchase agreements where we have zero capitalization costs. All we do is provide the land on which the facility is developed and then reap the savings that accrue. So that's, uh, that's a, a strategy that I really feel strongly we should be investigating more. Extensively. And allow them ownership? No, we maintain the ownership okay. and have the opportunity to own the, um, uh, the, the facility itself at the end of uh, uh, whatever time frame we set up for, that, for them to recoup their costs effectively. Thanks to you both. Okay, great. Um, seeing no other uh, comments, I will uh, thank our administrator very much for the presentation. Uh, the policy and council uh, was, we've removed that before the meeting, um, but things are already printed, so we're being environmentally friendly. Um, items for current or future discussion. Are there any other items for current or future discussion? Um, okay, seeing no pending items, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, is there a second? Uh, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Maybe that's why he's out of my... Michelle, do you want to do this? We've been working on this. What is this for? So, apparently, we got some people got an email that to write your mom. Uh, uh, like a, oh, yeah. Congratulations. I never got an email. Andy said he got a letter in his mailbox, but the date, the date had been. Good night, Andy. Sorry, the date had already passed. Oh. I said, Michelle, why don't we just make our own board of commissioners one? And then I said, why don't we see who the people she served with and see if they want to write letters. Yeah, yeah. And then we just do our own thing. Yeah. Right. And we just do our own thing right. and we put it together. And so we asked Greg last night if he could give us the people who served with her. Uh, and I added the administrator because I got them both. They're smart. Yeah. Right. And then whoever, someone, someone said there was one person before. Yeah. She was so on the board that hired Bob. Yeah. But so I think that's why Yeah, fifteen. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. These are the these are the emails that so far and phone numbers. So someone has to send that. I've been able to find. I don't know if you know any, but there's a golf one. I can do that. And I think Christina just did something. Yeah. So I mean, I would have Christina's. So yeah. That's easy. I mean, that's yeah, why I can do whatever I else didn't know, do, but I right. know. I was like, but I wanted to see if you knew it, because I kind of thought, well, we should start collecting these to be able to make, you know, like, right. either write an email from the two of us or, you know, to send to people yep. and then make calls. Yep. So the people who have um, components of it, he's never had an email. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? It is awesome. So, um, so, I don't, I don't have the, the that's all right, but no, I just put that there so you know. Yeah, we are so. I think if we had like an email or <laughs> okay, if we had email or right, I mean, obviously, if he doesn't do email, he probably can't text me. <laughs> yeah, so we'll just call him. So, like, I, I can just call yeah. him and, and you know, like, 
do a, and but then we could, like, we, we could do like a drink. <coughs> right, right, and, uh, right really exactly. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if we do, uh, can I take a picture of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. I can um, take volunteer a to try and get in touch um, with some of the people. What's your schedule tomorrow? I know we don't have, we'll probably get it out tomorrow, but so I don't know.